Lion in the Wind, Chapter 20 Persia walked slowly around the two lions closest to her and studied them curiously. So you're, like, really alive? This isn't some practical joke or something, is it? she asked. Penn tilted his head curiously. Why would we play a practical joke on you? he asked. Persia sat down in front of the two lions and shrugged slightly. Well, I don't know. How else am I supposed to explain why you just suddenly woke up and started talking to me? Dad said he hadn't loaded your AI software yet. So you shouldn't be able to talk with me right now. Breakman crossed his arms and grunted. I told you this was Mishwa's doing. Dr. Bergen had nothing to do with it, he said. That is correct. We have come at the request of Mishwa to assist our brother Chagani in his task of protecting our people from certain destruction, said Penn. Persia's face changed from one of confusion, to sadness, to anger, and then sadness again. That means you'll be leaving me too, right? she asked. Penn nodded. I'm afraid so. Tears formed in Persia's eyes. Why does this keep happening to me? First Chagani, then the others, and now you. It's their job, came a gentle, loving voice. Everyone turned in surprise to see Mishwa standing just behind Breakman with his arms held out in a gesture of love. Well, his timing's impeccable, thought Breakman. Who are you? asked Persia anxiously. Mishwa walked up to Persia and knelt down in front of her. I am Mishwa. I was the one who created you, and the lions, and gave each of you life, he said, his words exuding an incredible amount of love. Breakman furrowed his brow. Wow, there's a plot twist, he quipped. You, you, created me, she said, half in fear, and half in curiosity. But why? For what purpose, she continued. To be a mother to Chigani. For that, I blessed you with a mother's heart so that you would love and nurture him, and prepare him for the trials that lay ahead. But you took him away from me, didn't you? Why? Why would you do that? bellowed Persia as tears began to stream down her cheeks. Mishwa smiled kindly at Persia. My daughter, you have already done a great job of being a mother to him, and the other lions, just as I sent you to. But now you must let them go. Persia shook her head. No. I don't want to. I love them too much, cried Persia. She then leaned forward, buried her face in Mishwa's soft, warm shoulder and wept. Mishwa lovingly embraced her and held her tight as she did. Chigani and the others will return to you in time. But, for now, they must depart from you for a time. When their task is complete, I will bring them back to you for a season to share in each other's company. Now be at peace. Persia lifted her tear-soaked face and looked at him with deep, pleading eyes. Promise me I'll come back, she said as she tried to hold back her tears. Mishwa smiled and nodded. I promise. He then let go of her and gently wiped away her tears. She sniveled a little and then turned towards the other lions. What about them? she asked with quivering lips. They will leave you for a time as well. But, as I promised, they will all return to you again some day, said Mishwa. No offense, but this is getting kind of mushy. Can we move on to the good stuff? thought Breakman. Mishwa turned and gave him a knowing look. Breakman shrugged. Hey, I'm just suggesting, he said. Mishwa chuckled kindly, stood up, and then gestured to the other lions. Awaken, he cried. To Persia and Breakman's complete surprise, all of the other lions in the room twitched and began to move. They each looked around the room briefly before fixing their eyes on Mishwa. He then looked down at Penn and Teal, and said, I leave these lions in your charge. Take them to your brother and surrender yourselves to his leadership. He will guide you from there. Penn and Teal bowed. We will do as you've asked, said Penn. And with that, Mishwa vanished. Persia soon turned her attention to Penn as he quickly took charge of the other lions and organized them into groups, sections, squads, and teams. Then, just as they were preparing to leave, Persia hurried over to him. Penn, wait, she cried. He stopped and turned to her. Yes, mother, he said curiously. 
I need you to promise me something, she said. He tilted his head in interest. If it is within my abilities, I will do whatever you ask, he said. Protect Chigani at all costs. Bring him back to me alive and unhurt. Penn's eyes widened. But Mashua has already said that he will return safely. Promise me. Please, she insisted. Penn nodded. Very well, then, I promise. Persia smiled joyfully. Thank you. You are welcome. But may I now request something of you in return? he asked. Anything, said Persia gladly. Penn looked around the room briefly, and then back at Persia. Could you show us the way out? We are unfamiliar with this place, he said. Persia blinked in surprise. Oh, ah. Uh, yeah. Follow me. Odevian peeked out from behind a bush and studied the road in front of him. Not far away sat a jet black sedan that appeared to be waiting for someone. Nearby were several hunters, the Sadisan equivalent of special forces, who stood watch over the car. Knowing the reputation of Sadisan hunters, he was certain they'd spotted him already. But, just in case they hadn't, he decided it was best not to make any sudden moves that might startle them and accidentally get himself shot. He hadn't spent the last several weeks sneaking through Gorb territory to get shot dead now. He very gently stood up with his hands over his head and whistled to get the men's attention. One of the hunters raised an eyebrow slightly, and said, Are you just going to stand there all day, or will you be getting in the car soon? Odevian grinned. They had seen him. He then picked up his rucksack and trotted over to the car. As he did, one of the hunters opened the door and helped him inside. As the car pulled away, the hunters that had surrounded it quickly vanished into the nearby foliage leaving the road empty again as though no one had been there. The car then drove for several hours before turning off onto a long, winding gravel road that led up to a large and simple, yet sturdy log cabin. Upon arriving, a hunter standing guard near the front door escorted Odevian inside. As he entered the cabin he spotted a large, slightly overweight Sadison officer sitting on the other side of a table puffing quietly on a long, fat pipe that hung from his lips. Odevian grinned as he sat down across from him. Well Oik, I see you've put on a few pounds, he said. The officer chuckled and patted his belly. Eh, just a few. What may I do for you sergeant, he said in a deep Sadison accent. I was told you could help us win this war. Oik nodded, took a drag on his pipe, and said, Ah, indeed. And I believe I have just what you need to do that. But first I would like you to meet someone. He is one who will help us greatly in this struggle. He then looked to his left, and said, Fair Gant, our guest is here. Odevian looked to his right curiously, and then jumped up in surprise as a large, stout, Gorg officer stepped out of the shadows and into the light. Odevian immediately drew his pistol and aimed it at the man, but did not fire. What is the meaning of this? he asked anxiously. Put your weapon away, sergeant. We are on the same side, said the Gorg. Not last I checked, replied Odevian coldly. Oik motioned to Odevian, and said, yes, yes. He is with us. Now put your weapon away. Odevian eyed the Gorg officer as he casually sat down took a pipe from a bowl in the middle of the table, lit it, and then took a long drag on it. He looked over at Oik who rolled his eyes. Odevian slowly lowered his pistol, but didn't put it away as he sat down again. Sergeant, we have worked together many times before, have we not? said Oik. Yes, replied Odevian cautiously. So you should know to trust me by now, correct? Yes. Well then, why don't you? Your friend is a Gorg. Sergeant, when I say someone can be trusted, I know this to be a fact as I do not idly throw those words to the wind, said Oik. Sorry if I seem a bit skeptical, but there's this little thing called a war going on to the west of here where his people are slaughtering mine, said Odevian. Yes, this is indeed a terrible tragedy which we are working together to resolve, said Fergant. How? By wiping us out, said Odevian snidely. No, by stopping this dreadful war. Unlike many of my fellow countrymen, I do not support this travesty which is being committed against you. 
there are others within my nation who also share my feelings. But we are few, and are looked down upon by our people. Fergant studied Odevian's face for several moments, but only saw hatred in it. He sighed. I can see that building trust between us will take some time, he said. Odevian grunted sarcastically. Yeah, like a couple hundred years. Then will you also get mad at me because I have become friends with a gorg, said Oik. No, not mad. Just disappointed. Then I should be equally disappointed at you for the things you have done of late. Odevian stared at Oik curiously, but said nothing. Yes, sergeant. I am well aware of the many things you've been doing these past several months, said Oik with a grin. Odevian blinked in surprise. But, how? Only a handful of people know where I've been. Oik laughed heartily. I would not be a proper hunter if I didn't keep tabs on my friends. Odevian grunted slightly. All right, fair enough. But what does that have to do with him? Oik took a long puff on his pipe. If I am intimately aware of everything you have been doing, do you think that my friend here would not have received the same scrutiny? Odevian pursed his lips and thought. No, I can't imagine he wouldn't, he said after a moment. Oik laughed. It's how I came to know of Fergant and his struggle against his people. Odevian thought about this more, and then put away his pistol. All right, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt on this. Oik smiled. That is all I ask. Now, I will let my esteemed colleague give you what you seek for. And what is that? asked Odevian, half knowing the answer. Fergant turned to Odevian, and said, Why, a way to end this war, of course. Pentel peered through his binoculars and panned across the prairie before him. He watched as many Gorg units were doing their best to take cover inside of craters, trenches or anywhere else that offered them some form of protection from Yiggs and artillery fire. Off in the distance he watched enemy units maneuvering into their new positions as Gorg artillery fired sporadically at the Yiggs and lines. Off to the north he heard the faint whistle and boom of incoming artillery rounds as they crashed into the ridge line. If they keep shelling us like this, they're going to pound this place to dust, he muttered as he continued to pan the battlefield. I doubt they will. Well, not right away, anyways, said Sims. What do you think, Chigani? asked Welk. Chigani panned the prairie, his eyes zooming in and out as they identified various targets, and then discussed each of them with his siblings. We're assessing the situation right now, replied Chigani. Do you think we should make another attack tonight? asked Pentel. We all agree that it would be a good idea. We have 19 targets that we feel are of military significance that can be attacked at minimal risk to ourselves while achieving maximum damage to the enemy. However, there may be a problem, said Rank. What would that be? asked Sims. Rank turned to him and said, We've received reports that the Gorg have shifted a large percentage of their forces both north and south, avoiding our section of the line as much as possible. That puts the bulk of their fighting force out of our immediate reach. Sounds like they're getting the message, said Pentel. Yeah, avoid large cats with claws, quipped Welk. Lieutenant, we have come to an impasse, and seek your insight into something we are considering, said Rank. All right, what is it? asked the lieutenant. Given the recent redistribution of Gorg forces away from our current area, two possibilities exist. Either this is a trap, or it is a choice opportunity but we lack sufficient information to determine which it is. Hence why we require your input since you have a trait called intuition which we do not possess that somehow provides you with the needed information to make decisions when external data is insufficient to formulate a proper answer, said Rank. Pentel, Welk and Sims stared at each other for a moment, and then back at the Gorg lines. Intuition, eh? That line is stretched extremely thin, making it ripe for exploitation whereas the rest of their lines are solid as a rock, and nigh on impenetrable. That to me screams trap, said Welk. How hard would it be to breach their lines? asked Rank. Pretty easily, actually. At least, this part of it. I mean, that line is so thin right now that we could take two companies of men, maybe three, and some armor, and easily punch a hole in their lines big enough to sail a cord of tacks through with room to spare. 
Sims and Pentel stared at him in confusion. Welk grinned sheepishly. Sorry. Sailor's term. You probably don't know what attack is. The two men shook their heads. Attack is a large, three-masted ship from ancient times that was used to transport supplies up and down the coast. Accord is a formation of twenty ships sailing side by side in a V formation designed to maximize their speed across the water, said Welk. Well, how big of a hole is that? asked Pentel. Approximately a half a kilometer, said Welk. That's a decent-sized hole, said Sims. Well, making the hole isn't the problem. Maintaining it will be. I have a feeling that, if we go charging down there, and drive through their lines, they're going to converge on us from the north and south like the jaws of a giant predator and wipe us out, said Welk. So then an attack through that area with the lions would be fruitless, said Sims. Well, with pretty much anything, really. It certainly wouldn't gain us much except a lot of casualties in exchange for a small gorg body count. Given that apparent inevitability, it would be best for us to move north of here and attack, and then return south and attack there as well, said Nakasa. So you'd hit them where they weren't expecting you, asked Sims. Nakasa nodded. That's actually not a bad idea, said Pentel. Agreed. The confusion that would cause among the Gorg lines would be beneficial to our efforts, said Sabo. Well, I guess we should pack up and head north then. Where should we go first, said Pentel. But to his surprise, Chigani shook his head. Lieutenant. If you will allow us to undertake this mission on our own, we will be able to complete it quicker, and more efficiently than if you came with us. It will also ensure that your men remain safe, as movement in the open right now is very dangerous, said Chigani. Pentel looked out at the prairie and thought for a moment. If it's really that dangerous, you probably shouldn't go, he said. But we must go. If we do not break the Gorg fighting spirit, they will eventually overwhelm and destroy us, said Chigani. Pentel stood quietly and thought about this, uncertain of which way he should go. Seeing this, Chigani spoke up again. Earlier this week you trusted us enough to allow Rank and Pasa to infiltrate deep into Gorg-controlled territory to gather information. They succeeded with no troubles. You have also allowed us to make short assault missions from our position here on numerous occasions without your need to accompany us. I know this mission is much further away, and involves all six of us, but we can do as well there as we've done here, he said. But what if your mission goes south on you? asked Pentel. If it looks like our mission will not succeed, we will return to you as quickly as we can. Pentel thought about this for several moments longer, and then nodded, and said, All right, you may go. But make sure you bring everyone back in one piece. Chigani nodded. I will do my best, sir. Where are you going to begin your mission? After sunsdown. We will use the cover of night to conceal our movements. Pentel nodded. Good. Keep in touch whenever it's safe to do so. Chigani nodded. We will, 